Golden Day America. Stand by. I'm Jack Rickard, and this is Volkswagen Television. <laughs> yes. It used to be EVTV this week. We uh, threw that under the bus just completely. tossed it completely like a road we're, bump. We're pretty much VW <laughs> shop now. And so we're just going to do Volkswagen stuff. All right. This is my compadre and consigliore who uh, got me started with Volkswagens. El yes. Reno Noto. Hey, good to be here. It is Friday. Okay, you can have a few minutes to do the EV thing, then we're going to talk about VWs. All right, yeah, we'll talk about we'll talk about Tesla. EV stuff. I guess we'll talk about, yeah, Tesla and news and stuff, because we always do a little bit on Tesla at the we very beginning. We always do lead with Tesla, but we yes. wind up talking about Volkswagen. <laughs> we do, that's right. Um, so yeah. Elon had said at one point they were going to do a cross-country tour in uh, mm -hmm. Tesla. I, and they, they have launched it. Apparently Thursday they left from their L.A. design studio on the way to New York City. I don't believe that Elon is part of this uh, menagerie. It's not Elon and five kids. This is the Tesla official cross-country demo I, I, drive. I believe so, yeah. They, do they have stuff written on the side of the car? They do, Tesla and Supercharger. Yeah, exactly. So they're chart seeing if you can drive across country. The Supercharger network, they have left. Last update I saw, they, it was snowing pretty good in Wyoming, and they... Cars seem to drive pretty nice. They were they put 1,300 miles under the belt since Thursday evening. They bounced up from about 135 to 185 dollars today on their stock. Nice, nice. Um, one other thing too, Saline, which is a high performance tuner. They also sell a lot of just T-shirts and stuff. They're uh, but you know they really do high performance tuning. They do Fords, so they'll take a car, put a V. In fact, one of our guys here, um, uh, Preston, has a Saline truck. Um, like Senior Junior or something. Y yes, and in fact, uh, yes, that's kind of what it's like. <laughs> and uh, they are going to do the Model S. They're going to do a saline edition of the Model S. So that's that's cool to see an aftermarket tuner taking uh, taking the Tesla Model S and seeing what they can do with it. Drop a big block Ford in there. There you go. That's exactly it. You go right with that. That'll, that'll work out real good. Um, let's see. What else in news? Um, XG Sciences. I'm not too familiar except that they do graphene, and uh, Samsung has purchased them. Any comment there? Mm, um, they, they, they purchase is a strong word. Okay. We don't really purchase anymore. <laughs> uh, exactly. We just we acquire without purchasing. Well, Nippon Electric acquired a little company that did lithium batteries, and they uh, pursued yeah. their research and development. And then Nissan invested in them uh, to the point of owning fifty-one percent. Okay, of them. <laughs> all right. That's and how you Nippon do it. Electric Company, NEC, oh, still to this day owns forty-nine percent. It's called uh, Automotive Energy Corporation. Yes, in sure. Japan. So XG uh, received a significant uh, infusion from Samsung, uh, okay. who then like owns part of them. Okay. Okay. Cool. XG is about graphene. Graphene was theorized for ten years before anybody ever saw any of it, and in fact, the yeah. guy got a um, Nobel Prize for figuring out how to make it. Oh, he uh, <laughs> took a pencil and made some graphite on a uh, piece of paper and put a piece of scotch tape on it and then peeled it off. <laughs> and the graphite that stuck to the And the graphite that stuck to the tape <laughs> was apparently graphene. It's worth a Nobel Prize, huh? Yeah, worth a Damn. Nobel Prize. I, uh, Where were we? Yeah, who knew? How much scotch tape have I thrown away a pencil yeah, lead really, on it? Really, with pencil lead on it. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, some of this stuff is hard to take. I'm much more enthused by uh, the guy at um, Rice University, I think, who um, learned to laser scribe um, graphene oxide. He uh, oh. puts a plastic coating on a, 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 a DVD oh. and uh, puts some liquid um, a slurry of um, graphite oxide on that. And you know these laser scribe machines that duplicate lasers and even write like a little laser etched label in the top? Yeah, yeah. Like your logo or yeah, something? Yeah, sure, sure. Well, <laughs> it's got enough power to fuse that graphite oxide into graphene. Oh, really? Oh. And you can even make complex patterns on it. And so now YouTube is replete 
with dozens of people showing you how to duplicate How to this. do it. <laughs> um, if that works, one of these 60-watt laser etchers um, that they were using to scribe the Oh, yeah, we were trying that. Box, yeah, sure. Uh, ought to just make uh, graphene uh, to beat the band. But anyway, graphene has some magical properties. It's stronger than steel, one atom thick, conductive along its plane. And um, so they think it's the miracle um, material okay. for okay. Um, batteries. They're just not sure what that means what? or how you do that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so lots of graphing research. Uh, there's a guy on YouTube making a career out of mm, how to make graphene in your kitchen okay. videos. <laughs> oh, are they bad? He makes some smelly stuff. Oh, man. I'm not too sure how much of it's graphene, but he's having a good time. Something, huh? <laughs> I think a few too many vapors. That's there. what I'm thinking. You've got to be careful of those vapors. Too much, uh, too many so, graphene vapors. But graphene in the 60s. is a hot area of research. Yeah. And uh, in fact, uh, as I've said many times, if I was 20 years old, I'd be at, uh, in a material science. In the material program, science, yeah. Not, not in electronics yeah. or software. That's where all the cool stuff's going to happen. Let's see, what else do we what have do you know? here? Um, you know, I always like some <coughs> racing. You know, Big Daddy Don Garlitz from back in the 60s, drag racer, uh, is on a quest this year. I guess it's the 50th anniversary of him setting the 200 mile an hour record, um, which has been blown away since then. Uh, dozens and dozens of times. He wants to be the first to do 200 miles an hour in a uh, electric powered dragster <laughs> in 2014. So he's got, uh, I guess still our buddy, I think Dennis Barubi, I guess still holds the eliminator record at 7.956 at 159.85 miles an hour. <laughs> so he's looking to go 40 he's miles got, better. He's got a distance to go then. Yeah, he's got 40 miles an hour to go. Um, yeah. But a nice team. It's uh, interesting to see the old school guys. Mm -hmm. Uh, want to be electrier than now. That's right. That's when you know you're winning. That's right, exactly. Huh? We're winning, guys. We are winning. Um, just a little taste of public charging. The BMW exec, actually one of their board members, uh, Herbert uh, Deese, has just said acceptance of electric vehicles, no one cares about uh, public charging. It's all about, uh, all about home charging, which we've been saying for years. You know, it's not news, but it's nice to hear that other people. He's been uh, watching. Watching the show. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. and, and it is. There is, I've made an exception on this supercharging thing because it knocks off visibly a limitation that people have with the car. Yes. Now, I, got, I hate to be unsympathetic, but a guy with eight airplanes doesn't drive his electric car to California. <laughs> no. This <laughs> makes no sense. No. Why would I ever do Why that? Why would you do that? How about a King Air 200? That's right. A little more comfortable. Yeah. With a coffee pot and a <laughs> that's right. stereo. Yeah. And autopilot. Yes, autopilot. Real autopilot. Uh, I'd even do a DC-3 just for the romance of it. <laughs> exactly. But a Model S to California? I don't think so. <laughs> there aren't that many style. Jolly Ranchers left in the world. <laughs> to keep me going? <laughs> keep me going That's from right. here to California in a car. <laughs> but I think much will be made of it. It's going to be a huge deal. And I still think that General Motors and BMW and... Uh, Nissan are blissfully unaware of how out of position they are. Well, and this yeah. drive of the Tesla mm -hmm. car, of course, uh, Elon is a master at the managing the media, as uh, exhibited by his many friends at the New York Times <laughs> and, and the many friends he's made in uh, all these media. That's it, yes. But, uh, but he does know how to keep the spotlight on yes. And it goes right after, unapologetically, I like that about him, mm -hmm. um, the limitation that well, you can't drive your car coast to coast. Can't go cross country, exactly. Well, yeah, you can. And as we've said many times, if that's an objective, and as I said, think DC3. It's a lot more room, a lot more comfortable. <laughs> that's right. But if you have to drive a coast to coast, our entire interstate highway system of 43,000 something miles to put 
a charging station every 50 miles. Ain't no thing. They've already squandered that much money. You can do it for the amount of money a better place squandered yeah, on yeah. battery charging. Yeah. You're talking eight or nine hundred sites. Sure. Yeah. Just put them in rest stops. Yeah, I, I got a, <laughs> I got some news for you guys. The problem isn't having charging stops. The problem is having that kind of power. As yeah. we get into 200 and 300 and 350 mile cars, you're talking about 75 and 85 and 100 kilowatt right. packs. Right. If this graphene works out, you could have a 150 kilowatt pack in a suitcase. There ain't no 150 <laughs> kilowatts. It, uh, it, it, there's nothing to, that has that much power. How, 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 do you, how do you power it? There is one thing that could potentially have that much power, and Tesla is working furiously on it behind the scenes, and that is a solar-powered battery bank that you charge slowly using the sun, but it's so massive that you can pull cars in and they can dump 500 amps at 400 volts for 20 or 30 minutes and, and the battery there you go. just yeah. keep on going. Batteries can do that. AC electrical wires in our grid cannot, mm -hmm. not even three-phase. It cannot do that. It's not, it's not good to go there. And out in the hinterlands where we need this, that's the last that, place It's even to worse. Yeah, exactly. I had proposed at one point, why don't we do a national conduit? Okay. We have all these uh, power lines. I, I saw another one of these times. This guy was actually in Cape Girardeau, by the way. He had a little MD-500C helicopter with a big boom that laid out on the ground with five 36-inch saw blades on it. And he would take that <laughs> helicopter and pick it up and pick up that boom and go fly along the power lines, shaving off limbs off of trees 100 feet from the power oh, lines and, in the helicopter. Okay, keep And he's describing clear. all this to me, and I said, son, don't get in that helicopter and do that, please. And he just looked at me and he said, no, this is, I've found a way to make money with a helicopter. I said, you found a way to make yourself into a toasty bird <laughs> dangling from a high voltage Hanging from a high voltage wire. Now, don't do that. Two days later, here's his helicopter and this twisted <laughs> mass of boom. Apparently, he survived it, but he sure did mess up that song. <laughs> but they're out there doing that all the time uh, for these power lines. They sag in the summer when they get hot. Uh, they're the source of uh, many of our woes with the national grid, and not so much locally as in the intertie between different regions. Mm -hmm. Let's do a national conduit that can do data, power, um, I don't care uh, if you want water, uh, natural Twinkies. gas, uh, alongside the interstate. Sure, okay. Um, yeah. I mean, a conduit that you can drive a golf cart down through, it'll do maintenance and so forth, that adds all the stuff mm -hmm. that carries it from one city to the next because our interstate highway system, as it so happens, maps our population. Sure. Very precisely. Yeah. That's because all the population G grew up grew up around it. That's right. right. They say, "Oh, and, there's and the highway. I'm going over there." there. Next <laughs> so uh, this this would all work. That's a trillion dollar deal. But crime, apparently, a trillion dollars in Washington it, these days is lunch money. It ain't worth what it used to be, apparently. And imagine <laughs> the gain uh, in our the security of our national electric grid. But then you have electric power right down the highway. Now you can start talking about these. Uh, Wireless charging. Oh, the inductive the charging. Inductive loops sure. in the in the roadway. Sure. And so, yeah, that sounds wacky. It's really not that hard, but charging stations really aren't that hard. It's eight or nine hundred of them. Uh, everybody, I asked a guy this week. He said, "Oh, it's got to be fifty thousand, but maybe five hundred thousand." I said, "No, oh, it's, man, uh, it's like eight hundred and fifty. Um, this all is available to you." if you can work a four-function calculator. Divide uh, 43,700 by 50, and it, it'll all become clear. Yeah, and the rest of them will be in people's garages. 
rest of the charging. Just the rest of the just charging. 240 right charging just being I, you know, I don't know how to get this across to people. I, I hear this all the time. Maybe it's just me. I charge twice a week. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, I'm, I'm convinced we're building too big of packs. Let's build you, smaller let's, packs well, yeah. because I, I, I just don't need them. The car doesn't need it. Um, you're just pulling, dragging it around. Yeah, yeah, you're dragging around a bunch of battery weight. So yeah. that's my take on it. But I've, I've learned over the years to live with an electric car. And I think the entire society will become more culturated mm -hmm. and smarter about this as we go along. Um, it's, uh, they, they, you know, they're trying to be all things to all people. Cars have been specialized from the beginning. You would not take your wife to church in your landscaping truck. No. You're not, not going to tow always. your boat with a speedster. No, that wouldn't work either. No, it wouldn't work either. Uh, you're not going to do landscaping work and haul gravel in your Lexus sedan. Nope. That's, that dog won't hunt. No, nope, you're not going to There are any specialized devices and always were. And for a few people that are going to have one car live by themselves, you need a car that will swing a lot of different directions. Sure. But for most of us, the reason we have such a variety of cars is we need cars for a variety of things. Well, we do, yes. But mostly what we do with a car is go to Lowe's and stand there with two electrical pieces in your hand, <laughs> not light knowing bulbs. <laughs> which one to buy, because whichever one you buy and take home will be the wrong one, and you'll have to go back and get right. the other one. That's mostly what we do. Yes. Pick up prescriptions, dry cleaning, go to work. It's um, yeah, Bo box not of as exciting as I, I make it sound, <laughs> but that's where most of the miles go. What else you got? Um, let's see. What do we get? Oh, just two more items. One is we did report about the very last VW bus being made in Brazil last August. Mm -hmm. It's it is going to uh, the the factory museum in Stuttgart. So. I put up it. a picture of that. It's really weird. It's got a grill on the front. It's got a, a grill on the front. Yeah, it's yeah, it's got to be the water cooler. That's cool. the ugliest bus I ever saw. And the last thing was that uh, Porsche, when he was 22 years old, built an electric car in 1898. They found it since 1902. It has been in a warehouse. And they just now found it. They just now found it. And uh, that's going to end up in the museum in uh, Stuttgart. But he also did a hybrid, too. And maybe we can yes. show him a little... Um, uh, I've got a video clip of that hybrid. They, um, uh, it's not really of the original one. It shows some photos of it. But they uh, reenacted it or yeah, did a replica yeah, yeah, of it or yeah. built uh, some of the Porsche guys, actually, went back and got drawings or photos and, and sort of made one. They did, yes, exactly. And it's got to be the biggest, ugliest, stupidest-looking yeah. car I've ever seen. But yeah. it's... Uh, Got wheel motors. It uh, does. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Let's take a look. Okay. Rear wheel drive and front wheel steering. Powered by a self designed electric motor with an eight sided housing. Fabrikanten von Elektrofahrzeugen. Und um die ja, Einsatzmöglichkeiten dieser. Trey Cool. Well, that's like it Porsche. for news. We like Porsche. I think they're a little out behind the curve on this stuff. Considering we've been doing speedsters for four or five years. But Porsche and VW, what an impact on the automotive world. Um, and that takes us straight to um, Yehu Garcia. Talking about buses. And the VW <laughs> Samba bus. Yes. And uh, this little guy's about to pull it off with uh, flashlight batteries. Well, that's right. We've been talking about this and showing you guys for weeks, uh, Jehu and his, uh, his flashlight batteries. Let's take a look.
On this episode of the Electric Samba Bus, we finally check our custom 18650 module on our Samba. This week has been pretty hectic with other projects, but today I managed to spend a few hours working on the battery. After finishing the first module last week, it's time to charge it. The PowerLab 6 can charge up to 40 amps per hour if you have big enough power source of course, so it's perfect. To power it, I'm using a computer power supply I've converted into a benchtop supply. The label says it can deliver 27 amps on the 12 volt rails, but after experimenting to see how much I can actually pull out of it, it quits after 14 amps. So setting the power lab to limit its draw to 13 amps at 12 volts, it gives me 34 amps at 4 volts of charge. So at 34 amps per hour, I should be able to charge this module completely in 8.8 .8 hours. Of course, I only have a few hours to work on this today, so I will partially charge it, then do my test and finish charging it later tonight. Next, I will need to make some cables to connect this module to my existing system on the Samba. I want to place the module inside the vehicle in the luggage area so I can have better access to the voltage and temperature monitors. And also, in the unlikely event of a fire, I can easily pull over and extinguish the fire without even having to get out of the car. To connect this module to my system, I found the easiest place in the circuit right after the Hall effect sensor, right before the main contactor. I had to run the cables out through the side gas door and in through the window. That way I didn't have to mess with running cables out the back of the car having to possibly remove bolt-on parts. So here are the cables coming in and I have three uh, six, six gauge cables um, just because they're easier to handle. I think that's how I'm going to do the, the final you know, pack on these cells, on these modules or whatever. Here's a negative side uh, and it's got the quarter of 20 screw there and then another quarter of 20 screw and another one over there. And then it's got this little... So I'm gonna monitor with this guys here. This is temperature, and it's got a little probe that I just put in here and one between the cells. Uh, so this is 20.1 centigrades, and then this one over here, it's the voltage. Um, this is 3.9.2. I charged the cell to about 60%. Uh, that's what the charger said. It was about 60% step charge, which is about what my pack is right now. So if they all decide to die, it, even though today I'm just doing a simple roll test and, you know, maybe take it up to 20 miles an hour and just see what the load does on this guy. I'm going to put the, put a camera here to record this. Um, the sensors and then um, I'm going to, yeah, let's see see what happens. So. Unfortunately, today was a very gloomy day here in Rancho, and by the time I finished sorting everything out, it was already dark. So I will only really be able to go around the block as I can feel the rain coming down at any moment. Oh, my 
A few moments after I pulled up into my garage, the rain started coming down. But at least I got my ride around the block. For the very first time, the Samba moved partly being powered by recycled laptop batteries. Tonight was a small step, but as soon as the weather clears, I will finish putting this first module to the test. I want to see just how much it will sag under 650 amp load. I want to see if it heats up after 20 minutes of highway speeds. Unfortunately, all that fun will have to wait. So thank you for watching this video. Uh, make sure to catch next week's episode for more electric samba adventures. Uh, next week. lost our wheel right here folks if you enjoy my videos don't forget to subscribe to my youtube channel and join the conversation down below by leaving a comment uh, if you don't then also leave me a comment so i can make these videos better thank you that's a nice little demonstration. Yeah, you, you can buddy, do that's it. Some, that's some primary investigation. That is. That's you're, <laughs> you're plowing new ground. Yep, that's pretty darn good. And, uh, and Tesla could be afraid. They should be very afraid. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> a fleet of buses out there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this little guy comes up with a fiberglass, a rust-proof version of a 21-window Samba bus powered by laptop batteries. They should be afraid. I they know. should be very They're afraid. very afraid. <laughs> if Tesla isn't, the rest of them should be. <laughs> Putting a point on that. Um, we got our Doka. Oh, nothing. From, from, yes. From Oatmar. From Oatmar, yes. And we're going to talk about that. But first, uh, Oatmar has bit off a chunk. Oh, yeah. And uh, <laughs> he's uh, done a new video discussing uh, front-end geometry. And uh, uh oh, if he pulls this off, I'll be in awe. I think this project's headed for a, um, a redesign. Okay, okay. We'll, I think we'll re-engineer. I think we're going to redefine the scope of this project <laughs> so. here pretty quick. Uh, but I'm not going to tell him that. Let him, okay. let him go. <laughs> Keep sending him videos, man. <laughs> uh, but he's he's uh, does some some fascinating discussion of uh, some geometric problems uh, in putting a Tesla front end under a uh, Vanagon that's been stretched five feet. <laughs> yes, it has. Um, you go, girlfriend. Utma. Hi. This is an update of the Stretchla project. The Stretchla project is the combination of a Volkswagen Vanagon camper with the remains of a wrecked Tesla Model S to make an all-electric camper. I'm Otmar, and today we'll be talking about a few things. Um, the drawbacks of trying to save money and, uh, and the benefits with buying used parts and that sort of thing. Uh, other things that make me feel like I'm not making as much progress on the project as I'd like to. And, uh, and the fun stuff, the front suspension. What it takes to make it fit, what the problems are, what the challenges are, that sort of thing. All right, so first off, our current challenge, the next step is to get the wreck Tesla running well enough to be legal on the road, to test the systems, get rid of the error codes, make all the subsystems work. I'd rather do that on the original Tesla, which is still easier to fix than changing all the systems, moving them into the van again, and then trying to diagnose them. Um, the progress on that, you know, it uh, it could have been pretty quick if I just spent a lot of money on it, um, but I'm being a little cheap. Those of you who uh, who have watched my written blog saw that the last update was about the, the costs of doing this. So we're looking at uh, more than $8,000 worth of parts in order to get this just running. That's no body parts, nothing pretty, uh, just to get it functioning 
relatively well on the road. Uh, in trying to avoid that, I'm looking for ways to get around it, uh, as is typical. One of the major expenses is the steering rack, which had its cast knobs broken off. You know, the mounting threaded sections there are broken off. Uh, with a bunch of research and with friends looking on the internet, uh, we've discovered that it looks very likely, even the casting numbers match, that this is the same aluminum housing that's used in the last few years of Land Rover Evoque right-hand drive vehicles. So I've been scouring uh, eBay in, the, in England to try to find a, a used part, and there's been a couple that I missed uh, just barely on time, and then there were a couple later that were much more expensive. And uh, so with looking and waiting and negotiating, and now finally I've, uh, I've uh, bought one that with shipping should come in a little, well, around 700 US. Um, that of course is a risk in itself. When it gets here, we'll see if it actually fits. Uh, my plan is to take all the guts out of the Tesla rack, all the electronics, all that stuff, which I've already taken apart, and put them in with this new housing that's all uh, whole, that has good mounts. Uh, there's a risk that maybe the electronics don't recalibrate right where they should have been, um, but I'm trying to keep things pretty well aligned where they are, so hopefully, hopefully that'll work. Uh, but that's definitely, I feel like I've been kind of spinning my wheels, uh, not making a lot of progress while I try to look at all these expensive parts and try to find a way to get them cheaper. I haven't seen a single wrecked Tesla being parted out, so normally one might go to a junkyard, but this car is just too new for that. There's not enough of them out there. Um, so yeah, pretty soon I'm going to give up and just start spending money. Uh, but if this steering rack comes in and, you know, that saves me over $2,000, that, that's a pretty big deal. Uh, there's a bunch of other parts. The front steering knuckle, you can see how the top's broken off on that one. The, uh, the air spring for the air suspension, that one got broken in half in the accident and pretty smashed up. So I'll have to replace that. Uh, the lower control arms, things like that. I don't expect to see any, uh, any better deals coming along uh, unless we find a wreck that's being parted out. So those I think I'm just going to have to buckle down and, and buy from Tesla. and Well, that'll be all right, too. Um, there are a, there's another category of parts, and that is things like the, the active louvers, louvers that regulate the airflow into the radiators. Uh, I'm getting a lot of error codes related to that cooling system because they're completely missing. Uh, I didn't even get the broken parts when I got the car. And so I figure if I could find some louvers that are cracked, scratched, broken, whatever, they would at least calm down the error codes and satisfy the system. Uh, similarly, something like the left side air conditioning condenser, I just need one that, that holds, holds gas in it. Uh, a fan, a uh, fan controller less likely. But some of these parts, I imagine, um, there's probably Tesla body shops throwing them away regularly because they get scratched, a little bit cracked, a little broken, and of course they have to be replaced with new ones. So. Um, if any of you know of a Tesla body shop that you're good terms with, friends of yours, who may be willing to support the project by giving us extra parts, um, I'd be real happy to pay shipping and some time for them to pack it or whatever. Uh, maybe end up saving me one or two thousand dollars on the whole project. And if not, well, I'll just have to address that uh, as time goes on. But I'd uh, I'd like to see. I'd like to start making progress a little faster, so uh, I'm going to start pushing a bit. Uh, the tires and wheels. Uh, two of the wheels were damaged on this car. Uh, I also want to have at least one spare, if not two. Uh, this car has the Goodyear tires, which as I understand are good, but the Michelin tires are supposed to be better and lower rolling resistance. So I've been looking. And uh, I think I've located a set of four Michelin tires takeoffs with the Tesla wheels uh, for a decent price. And uh, I have a friend who's now uh, Lowell Simmons. Thank you for uh, looking into that and trying to get them and, uh, and ship them to me. So that's some progress. That's kind of fun. Uh, otherwise, 
well, there's, there's more to life than just the Tesla project. I've been uh, making a little bit of progress on uh, new code for the hairball. This is part of a Zilla motor controller that I developed. Um, my friend Hayu and I have been working on, uh, mostly he has, and I just advise him, working on a uh, tri-Zilla three-phase high horsepower controller. And so that takes some time, but it's a lot of fun. Um, but it, I feel like I haven't made a lot of progress on the stretch line. And I, I look back and I see, well, that's part of it. Mostly it's hours spending searching eBay and various online and trying to find parts for less money. And it's just it's kind of an uphill battle with, the, with such a new car. So on to the fun stuff, the uh, front suspension. So you can see here, um, I, my intention is to put the whole Tesla suspension, tires, wheels, brakes, the whole setup under the van. And initially you look at that and you say, oh, that's, that's not that hard. Cut a big hole, put in some framework, make it all adapt. Um, when you actually have the two cars sitting next to you and you pull out your, your metric tape measure and start measuring things and, and uh, making one-tenth scale drawings and measuring all kinds of stuff and I like to take pictures with a tape measure in the picture and then I'll, I'll sketch up dimensions and critical dimensions and things like that to see it. Uh, alignment specifications to get stock ride heights. Um, so there's a lot of very simple math here. Um, figuring out the heights of all the various parts. Mostly it's in the vertical axis that I'm running into to issues here. And that is that uh, we start with a <clears throat> stock 15 inch wheel on a Vanagon that comes out about 24 inches on the outside. And we switch to a 19 inch wheel on, from the Tesla, uh, which besides being a little farther out, wider, uh, is uh, almost four inches larger in diameter. So there's an absolute limit that when you bottom out the suspension, that wheel can't go through the fender that we have there. Uh, ideally, I'd like the van body to sit as low as possible on the highway for aerodynamics. I'd like the ground clearance to be as high as possible for clearance off-road and that sort of thing, and also for aerodynamics. And I'd like to avoid raising the seating position any. Uh, this one is already slightly higher than stock, and I notice it, and I'd rather not go any higher. I intend to put the Tesla seats in there, as well as the dashboard. And I love the Tesla seats. They feel really good, all these adjustable lumbar supports, uh, all that sort of thing. But they are about 10 millimeters higher from the seat rail to the seating position. So there's a little bit lost there. And then there's some major interference with the uh, upper control arm on the Tesla and the air strut top. These are things that were never designed for to go into a van where you're sitting on top of them. So they designed the suspension to optimize the handling and the performance and the weight efficiency. Uh, it tends to make for a really tight fit uh, between the seat rail and the bottom of the subframe that holds the lower control arms. We're looking at about I think 660 millimeters of distance there. And no matter how you, how you run it, you hold that tape measure up, you look at it, and if you don't lower the seat, I mean, I'm sorry, if you don't raise the seat, your bottom of your control arms and all that is all about, about 50 millimeters lower than this suspension here, which is the four-wheel drive uh, jacked up high clearance suspension. So in the end, um, I guess I have to give up some of my ideals and uh, run the body height a little higher than I had hoped uh, just to, to make it all fit without going into a massive redesign of the front suspension, which is beyond me. And uh, well, you know, we'll run it as, it as it goes. So a number of people have asked me, why not just use the suspension off the van again, the original one. It fits, it works, there's clearance. I could adapt the motor to fit inside it and that sort of thing. And although that's a possibility, there's a few reasons uh, why I'm avoiding that. Um, the weight rating of the Tesla suspension, the axle rating is actually higher than the Vanagon rating. 
Uh, I'll be exceeding it some, uh, but I'd like to start with a higher number just at the beginning. The, um, the Tesla has air suspension. And I've owned a car with air suspension before, and I really like that. This, um, what do we call it, the uh, smart air suspension. Um, really smooth ride, adjusts heights. If it, it remembers where you were using a high height, then goes back to it. Uh, that's, that's a pretty cool feature. My last car with air suspension, uh, when I took that on washboard dirt roads, what a smooth ride it was. It was really good. Since this will see occasional washboard dirt roads, but when I'm on them, it's usually for a couple hours at a time. Uh, I think that's worth quite a bit. So that's worth some effort. Um, the other thing is the brakes. Have you seen the brakes on a Tesla? I mean, look at these things. They are monsters. Got those, those big Brembo calipers, the huge ventilated discs. They are, geez, they're almost as big as the, the wheel on the, on the Vanagon. So I had upgraded the brakes on the Vanagon to these ventilated South African disc brakes, and they, I thought they were big, but they're nothing compared to these Tesla brakes. So that contributes a lot to safety. You know, great braking, that's a good thing. Um, so that's worth something in itself. Speaking of the brakes, um, the Tesla has ABS, and that's, you find that on any modern car. The Vanagon does not have that. Um, the Tesla also has regenerative braking, and it's not safe, and the Tesla won't allow you to use regenerative braking if your ABS system is not functioning properly. I really want regenerative braking on this vehicle because it's big, it's heavy, and it's going to drive in the mountains. Uh, it'll be worth having. So without uh, ABS, if your regenerative braking came on so strong to cause the wheels to slide, there would be nothing to stop it from sliding and it would be a real safety problem. So with the ABS, as soon as the ABS kicks in, the motor controller can respond and reduce the regenerative braking so that the braking system can handle that and maintain the traction. Um, so that's another reason to keep the, uh, the air suspension in that, in that setup. So that's most of it, I think. Um, yeah, just spent a lot of time with, uh, with scale drawings, rulers, cameras, tape measures, a whole lot of head scratching, and uh, it's, it's been fun, um, but I, I'm getting a little antsy to make some progress. I'd really like to get this Tesla on the road soon so I can start taking it apart and, uh, and putting the parts under the van again. Um, lastly, I want to send a shout out to Nikki at Transport Evolved. The other day she uh, reminded me that we should all be wearing these wonderful, wonderful t-shirts that say, I void warranties. I think that's just as appropriate as can be. Uh, I had a lot of fun being on her show the other day, and, uh, and that was really great. Um, that's it for today, and we'll see you next time. A couple of little bumps, maybe. Uh, well, one, one, <laughs> one Tesla parts are expensive. They are expensive. See, one of the reasons we've become VW TV instead of EV TV <laughs> is electric vehicles are quite expensive, and Volkswagens aren't. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they're uh, not. You can just get parts and stuff yeah. really pretty dirt cheap. Yeah, yeah. For most of them, you what, what, What's a, a tricked out TV performance motor for a VW run? Oh, I mean, really tricked out? Yeah. yeah, a few grand, maybe more. Really three. tricked out. Yeah, four, three, four, yeah. Three, four thousand dollars. Yeah. Uh, a tricked out racing transmission. Three? Mm -hmm. Yeah, another three, yeah. Yeah. Uh, side mirror. Eight yeah, bucks? Uh, yeah, just, <laughs> yeah, you want a stock Brazilian reproduction. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Eight bucks, maybe 14 for a really special one. Uh -huh. <laughs> and so um, they're felt quite easy to work on. Uh, parts are readily available for them. There was a Brazilian of them. Yes. And, um, and so uh, they're a very approachable car. That's where Otmar is coming from. He's got a 914. Right. And, yes. and several 
VW bus type things. Yes. But his stretch is the latest uh, incarnation of that and suddenly he runs into the Model S. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Has to chase down to England to get a Land Rover um, uh, steering uh, box, uh, which happens to be the one used in the, the Tesla. The one that's in the Tesla. That's a Brazilian dollars. And, uh, Imagine that. <laughs> so, yeah, it gets icky. Yeah. Uh, it's quickly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so he's going to try to get this Tesla going. I, I think he's going to wind up maybe having some innovative body work uh, and, and wind up with a Tesla. <laughs> there you go. And still need to do the, uh, um, well, I'm, you know, I'm, it's not my call. He's it was doing this for 20 years. He, uh, uh, if anyone can do it, he can. Mm, absolutely. And, um, but I just looking at it, it sounds like. I would be back and away from it at this point, saying, let's, uh, let's uh, take two. Let's rethink this. Yeah, shut off the camera. Let's think about this and then turn it back on and run again. Um, but God love you, Omar. That's, uh, if, if you're uh, not living on the edge, you're taking up too damn much room, <laughs> aren't you? Taking up too much room. That's, <laughs> it. that's right. That's right. That's right. No, nobody's following you. You must just be on a walk. And we have benefited from his largesse. Uh, I have played out the uh, weekly soap opera of Jack's buying Oak Mars Doka back and forth for a month or two. Yes. Guess what showed up this week? I do know what showed up this week, yes. Uh, <laughs> we'll introduce it. It's the Doka. All right, let's take a look. Here it is. We're missing, I guess, the um, historic registration by a year, so I think they have to be 25. This is a 90. Oh, registers regular vehicle, reg, regular vehicle. Get the inspection done. Have to make sure all the brake lights and all that kind of stuff work. I'll check the VIN. The state of Missouri will be done with us. And uh, get it off to a body shop. Looks like we'll paint it the same color as the, uh, as the thing. That nice bright kind of optic yellow that uh, paint golf balls so you don't lose them. So kind of Kind of fond of that color, and uh, we'll look at all the window glass, uh, interior things like that, and just see what we uh, what we need to do to get it to, to get it going. All right, so we did locate the uh, battery. It's easy to get to. It's kind of behind the passenger seat and not really covered per se. It's. Uh, but he's got his jump box on there, and we'll see if we can uh, if we can get this thing held and running. And then we'll be in. Uh, then we'll be. Hey, now you can hear the hear the Doka too. Look at that. We've got the Doka going. Nice. Okay. Pretty cool, and it runs, which is even better. Nothing better than a running doka, I suppose. But I guess we're going to have a whole lot of running doka jokes here at uh, EVTV. But uh, look at that. We've been doka. Double doka dare. Now look at that, disappearing into EVTV, the Doka. Catch you on the other side, Johnny. Making electric boats isn't just making boats cleaner, it's making boats better. Being out in an electric boat means you can enjoy the environment you're in. You are so much more immersed in the sound and the experience of the aquatic life, of the water, of the wind, than you would otherwise be. And it really gives you a new level of understanding and enjoyment of that generally beautiful nature you've gone into to enjoy yourself. What an electric motor does is that it gives you all this power in a vibrationless, soundless way. 
A well thought out, well designed system has 100% of the torque available all the time. You don't have to build up to it, you have it. So when you pump the throttle, you are out there and your whole shot is amazing. Uh, it takes your center of gravity right out from under you and it gives people that what they call the EV grin. You just start laughing, you can't help it. You're so conditioned to think that you first need vibration, then need noise, and then you start going somewhere. And in this case, your center of gravity just shoots right out from under you. And uh, it's a wonderful feeling. You can still talk to each other. You're hearing the sound of the water and the wind and the waves instead of just hearing engine noise and vibrations. And it gives you really a chance to be in tune with that nature that you're actually out there to enjoy. Plus, not having to visit the pump is actually a great thing. Your battery will eat electricity from any source that you provide. I mean, who loves sitting around on your knees with a jerry can? We have better control over the boat. We have a better experience while we're out driving. Plus, we also have the knowledge that we're part of new technology. It is just way cool. Our mission is to make beautiful, fast, and fun electric boats. There's nothing more fun than taking these new technological developments and putting them into classic designs and having people shoot away with a big smile and an EV grin. Brain, we need more cars. <laughs> Where the heck did this one come from? <laughs> we have a, uh, you have a Carmen Ghia project. I do. And I have a thing project. I know. <laughs> I still have to get my JevQ software sorted out. Um, we have the other Speedster too. The, yes, uh, we do. The carbon fiber is speedsterous. Yes, we do. <laughs> and I'm starting to get some of those lightweight um, NMC batteries in. Yes. I got 41 of them. They owe me 159. They owe you 159 of them, I know. I think we're going to do a. Uh, um, I seem to have a plenty of Siemens motors. Yes, we have a lot of Siemens motors. Oh, I bet <laughs> it'll twist that little. Uh, um, <laughs> to spin the car around like a rotisserie? <laughs> I, I think I'll twist that little speedster into a, a, a pretzel. You know, I'm not. <laughs> and uh, so I want to try it with uh, a lightweight pack. Um, That'd be nice. You need to uh, get our copper worked out and our roll bar. Yes. Because uh, that's going to be your racing machine. I'll uh, use it to pick up chicks. There you go. That's right. We each do what we do best. Yeah, that's right. Got to do what you got to do. <laughs> so we have three pending, or three, uh, two in work, another thing in a Speedster pending. Yes. And we're about broke. <laughs> and I'm out there buying <laughs> cars. I, I got it's another one. I noticed uh, this morning. Uh, Otmar Abenhake, who is the... Um, mm, uh, I consider him one of the pioneers in the DIY movement. He uh, yes. reverse engineered a Curtis controller because people kept blowing them up. I think they were blowing them up from inadequate heat sinking. Oh, okay. Curtis so has they, a they note still in the front it, yeah. of the manual that you need, you know, set, set square yeah, meters, like of, meters heat of heat sinking. None of the DIY guys <laughs> knew what that meant, so they would just put it in the car and just then slap it would them blow in. up. Uh, he reverse engineered a Curtis controller and made his own with parallel MOSFETs using newer mm -hmm. silicon and and kind of for the guys that wanted to go racing. Go for the racing community, yes. So he did a 1,000 amp controller where the Curtis was about 500. Yeah. And then he did a 2,000 amp controller. Yes. And um, when I okay. came on the scene, he was about to have a nervous breakdown because he had a six month backlog and he couldn't Man. keep up with it. And the college kid he'd hired and trained to put him together was going away to work for Burlington Northern or something. Or something, huh? And <laughs> leaving him, and uh, and he just uh, and he was trying to sell the company. And I talked to him a little bit about buying it, but um, I told him basically the problem is you raise your prices. Well, then nobody would be able to afford one. Well, yeah, but your backlog would <laughs> go rid, away. Get rid of that backlog. <laughs> and you wouldn't have a nervous breakdown. That's right. It'd be fine. Yeah, There's the, a way to tune that uh, demand and that price, uh, yeah. you know, for, for uh, Gotta love it. your comfort. Yes, exactly. But, yeah, yeah it's basically a grow-or-die situation in any young business. Mm -hmm. That's your yeah. two picks. Right. 
And, uh, but he is uh, now um, kind of back uh, playing around uh, the uh, Manzanita Micro has mm -hmm. taken over the production and marketing of his Zilla. And um, so yeah. he's free to adventure and he likes to go out in the desert and hang out. Oh, there you go. Okay. Which is not bad work if you can get it. That's right. <laughs> yeah, go out and just hang um, out. He was going to convert this into a four-wheel drive. It's a, a two-wheel drive um, double cabin, uh, double cabin. Yeah. Yep. And um, and instead, he took two Bannigan wagons <laughs> yeah. and wed them into <laughs> one monstrous, I don't know, 70-foot long. Two cars in one. Yes, yeah, two, 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 <laughs> two vans in two, two, one. Vans in one. <laughs> and it's gonna, he's calling it a stretch, and now he's calling it a stretch la, because he's going <laughs> to take a wrecked Tesla and and basically transplant a Vanagon double body onto it. <laughs> Just graft it. Mount the front end and the, and the rear end uh, running gear under the Vanagon, the battery pack, oh, everything down to the rear, outside rear view window. Really? Mirrors. Oh, man. Are all going to be wired up as they, it, it, it's going to make it think it's a Tesla. It's going to be a Tesla. But it's going to be a stretch lock. <laughs> And so he, uh, yeah, I love it. Tesla parts are quite expensive, and I bet. Um, so he wanted to get rid of uh, the uh, uh, Doka, and um, I told him I'd take it if he wanted to get rid of it, and uh, I really thought he, somebody else would take it away from him, um, but um, it didn't, so I bought it. Yes. Now why? <laughs> Um, well, it's you, partly. All right. You've got me kind of into this Volkswagen thing. Into the Volkswagen thing. thing? All right. The uh, German mind of engineering is bizarre, the way they piece things together. I can't get my head to work that way, but I've grown to admire it. I'm not a big fan of their steel. These VWs are all <laughs> rust buckets. <laughs> They're, they do They're horrible. Rust. Yeah, a little rust. But um, they're simple, and I can understand them. Mostly, mm -hmm. um, yeah. and and there's a ready availability of parts because they have kind of a cult status out there. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And so yes. you find guys that know about them and carry parts for yes. them, even for something like this. And therein lies a tale. This is actually quite a rare beast, and there's a reason why. In 1962, I was seven years old. How old were you? Four? No, 62. I was five. Five? Yeah, I was five. So when he was five yeah. and I was seven, yeah. in spite of us having cleaned their clock in the Second World War, <laughs> we just couldn't let it go. And the uh, German uh, chicken farmers were up in arms over the importation of cheap American chickens. Yes, that's right. Now, these were cheaply made chickens. <laughs> they would come apart in one fry. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They just, and some of them had no bones. I mean, right. they just lay they there. Just, well, just, just, oh, the humanity. We had uh, <laughs> a young man at that time, uh, Colonel Harlan Sanders, <laughs> yes, that's right. just about to change the world. And... Uh, so with a bucket of chicken, we attacked <laughs> Germany. We re reinvaded them, huh, with the Colonel Sanders? To quell <laughs> the rising ire of the German chicken farmer, Germany imposed a 25% tariff on American chickens. Oh, man. Who would have thunk it? The Johnson administration <laughs> was not going to lie down for this. <laughs> And in 1963, they responded with a 25% tariff on light commercial vehicles. Oh, yes. Which, at that time, only Germany made. Yeah, you're right. You wouldn't have had a lot of imports from Japan in that segment. And therein yeah. lies the other part of the tale. Yeah. In the 70s, I was um, stationed on the USS Midway 
we were home ported in the uh, y Yokosuka, Japan. I lived up in Yokohama and fell in love with these little vans like our green van. Yeah, like the green van, sure. A little bitty uh, commercial van. Um, and they were just handy as they could be. Mm -hmm. And everybody buzzed <laughs> around in these things. And uh, I was sure that they would wind up being back here in the States and would be the biggest thing since sliced bread. Yeah. I, I knew the they, I knew one, they yeah. would just take the U.S. over. They were economical. You could haul stuff. Uh, they were very flexible. Lots of doors and stuff. Never happened. No, it really and didn't. And that's because yeah. of the chicken tax. <laughs> the, the light, sorry, the chicken tax on light trucks. That's right. <laughs> Volkswagen sold 21 million Beetles mm -hmm. in the first WAG. Um, we have uh, two things in here, which they only sold two years, 73 and 74. Right, right. Their upscale car was the Carmen Ghia, which yes, you're working on right now and still battling the rest. Almost done. Almost well, to a standstill. Watch the, watch, the, watch the rest of the segment. <laughs> we'll update you. <laughs> And uh, and there were a lot of vans. I've owned two of these. I, well, I own a, a 67 um, combi bus. Uh, what was that, a nine window or something? Pro yeah, I think so, nine or 13 back then. Mid nine, and, probably. And I yeah. uh, loved it. Yeah. It wasn't a West failure or anything. It was just, uh, you know, uh, it had uh, vinyl seats and rubber mats. And I had four little kids. And I could <laughs> take them to Dairy Queen and just throw ice cream at them. Just <laughs> anything they wanted. We're all gonna eat <laughs> ice cream That's until right. we fall down <laughs> right. with an epileptic fit, uh, right. diabetes, just, 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 insulin, <laughs> be an insulin shock. That's right. <laughs> and I'd load them up in that, I called it the pickle because it was green, mm -hmm. and would bring them home and I'd run them out and get in with a garden hose and flush it like a <laughs> toilet. Because the seats were vinyl, had rubber floor mats um, some paint, and uh, that's that was that's it. it. Yeah, that's it. Um, it didn't have much for heat, and this was in Denver, Colorado. So after Brian and I made a trip to the airport in the snow <laughs> with him leaning out, moving the windshield, <laughs> moving the wiper windshield with wiper. his hand, no heat in Are the vehicle. Are we there yet? <laughs> I traded it in on an '84 Vanagon, which is the new version of the. Uh, of the bus. Of the bus, yeah. And they made that from 1980 until uh, 1991. Skipped 92 and introduced the Eurovan in 93. Oh, yeah, okay, sure. Um, and they uh, sold a lot of vans. And a lot of yeah. them were Westphalia campers. Yes. Very popular. Yeah, very popular, absolutely. And again, they just became uh, another cult. Now, I don't think the 60s bus, the Type 2s, really will consort with the Type 3 Vanagon guys. I think there's some sort the, of there division is, there. There, there is, there is a, a clash of cultures there. Yes. yes. I don't think they're really <laughs> nice to each other, but, uh, but they each have their own cult, yep. and, uh, and I've had one of each. And I love them. Yeah, they're great vehicles. Yeah, I had an 80. They just strike they hit my sense of whimsy. They yep. make this, uh, uh, they sound like a lawnmower. <laughs> um, it's kind of wheezing along. They're, they're not even particularly economical. <laughs> no. They, they have a, you're kind of sitting in front of the front wheels. Yes. You know, up in the <laughs> safe position there, leading with the face That's right. in any kind of uh, interstate face-off there. That's you, right. You're, you're you going in first. first. That's right. You're going in first, and, man. Uh, <laughs> it suits my sense of whimsy. These were very rare because this is, the, in German, the Doppelkabine. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, we call them a Doka. A doka. Yep. But what that means is double cabin. This was one of the early crew cabs. Yes. And it's a pickup truck version, which makes it a commercial vehicle, and they imported a zero of them into the United States. Yes. None. Yeah. Nada. There was never one showed up at a Volkswagen dealer in the United States, right. ever. That said, they did import them into Mexico and Canada, and some of yeah. them leaked through across sure. the border. 
Uh, some guys actually imported them individually. Brought them over from Germany. Brought yeah, them over sure. from Europe or yeah. had them imported and had to, you know, pay a thing to get them. Uh, you got to get them federalized in yeah, the U.S. Uh, yeah. All that. Yeah. And, uh, but I don't think, um, Oatmar says maybe 200. I would be very surprised if there's 100 of these in the country. Really? Wow. Yeah, because they, they were just never imported here. And um, so uh, of either the 60s version, which they also had a... Uh, it, right, they also had a, a crew cab. A, a yeah. single and a crew yeah, cab. Yeah, they did have a single cab A pickup well. truck. Yeah. And then this, which is winds up being a quite roomy um, crew cab with a pickup truck bed that's kind of high that the sides fold down. Let's take a look at what we got back here. All right. So our chicken truck here, on <laughs> yes. this side, we've got two <laughs> doors and really a quite spacious, I mean, cap capacious uh, yeah. back seat area. You can sit down and put your feet up. Yeah, um, that's, that's pretty big. And an easy entrance to yeah, it. That's now pretty understand big. there's two doors on this side. There's only one on the other, and that's for the driver's side to get in. So it's yep. a three door, yep, three door, but a lot of room yep. in cool. the back seat. Yep. And of course, under the back seat would be a good place for batteries, but there's a better one. We uh, did a piece by Richard Van Wyke. He was doing a blue one of these, oh, we and he the actually here. used our there we go. Um, thing with the um, uh, that we used on the Mini Cooper, some slides from oh, those, those guys S in Colorado Springs. STSC or whatever, yeah, the, the, the heavy duty rollers. Yeah, they make slides for like railroads and stuff for drawers and, and things. They're big, there heavy industrial slides. Did that make my butt look big? It probably did. I bet, yeah. Um, but um, at least you have one. <laughs> <laughs> I hate it when that happens. <laughs> this, uh, they call the treasure chest. It goes all the way through and has an identical door on the other side. Down That's low. That's pretty cool. In the yeah. middle of the vehicle. Yeah, on the inside of the wheels. Perfect yeah, nice. for weight and balance. Yeah, nice. And he put together some battery racks that slide out on slides. And where we could slide them out, have a little piece made to prop up Probably the end. Support it, yeah, a little leg. And I could sit down on a stool and be working these batteries. You're doing batteries, yeah and checking them and so forth. And when I get done, slide them back in, take the prop out and lay that in somewhere and go around to the other side and do the same thing. Right, right. And I think nice. that it would be down low. It would be amidships. And um, I think it would be perfect. Um, this, can you set that down? Yeah. And, and show me how to make us well on the uh, drop oh, size. Is there a little, there we go, a little lock there. And that drops right down. It's got a little bumper, nice. That's a pretty good size Kind of bed. waist level right here. You can load stuff. This yeah. would be your perfect uh, beach buggy, throw your surfboards, cup of coolers of beer. Yeah. Seating for four. Nice. Take yeah. off for the beach. This is better than a woody wagon. Yeah, and that's a pretty big bed back there. You don't have any wheels intruding on it or a double wall. Mm -hmm. it's, that's, a, that's a big truck bed. Uh, it's kind of shallow and it sits up a little bit high for American taste. Yeah. This isn't a Ford F-150. No. But that's because there's no wheel wells you don't have inside. Any wheel wells. Yeah, right. Uh, and or outside. So you have a very wide flat bed and in fact you can fold the sides down and strap stuff to it so on and so forth a little access panel here um, to help you get into the engine compartment because the door back here is not huge so it's got kind of a low door yeah and, it, and that makes sense because the regular vanigan you'd have you would have a much bigger door to be but able to they get to went it. Yeah. to what is this a flat this is this is this is cooler? this is still a flat four. Yeah, the uh, Vosser boxer, the uh, the the boxer engine that's water cooled. Yes, mm -hmm. liquid cooled. Well, so we have a short um, 
engine compartment, but it's enough room for two Barca loungers in there. Yeah, there's some uh, there's some room. And with that plate that <laughs> comes pop off, your head out. <laughs> we can get into it. Um, the other thing I'm uh, amazed at with this vehicle, now this is a 90, that's the uh, 91 was the last year. And this had obviously been sprayed because they sprayed over some rust and stuff. But I'm, uh, for a VW, um, I mean, we're going to find some in the engine compartment. Yeah, there'll be, there'll be some. Wheel wells and stuff, yeah. but a relatively pristine, big crease below the doors. Yes, yeah. Uh, which is a blessing on the right side. Yeah, over here, yeah. And uh, rust runs bleeding through an overspray. Yeah. And um, we just have to take it down, have it ground to dust, <laughs> put some primer on it, and then get it painted. A couple of uh, dings in the windshield. Yeah. We'll put in a new windshield, the new put windshield. in all new glass rubber. Yes. And uh, I guess we'll have to do an interior. Yeah, it's a fairly spartan, fairly simple interior, yeah. Yep. Yeah. And um, so I think this thing is going to go great. Um, we'll put a Siemens and Demock in it because I've got them laying around. Yeah, we've got them, exactly. I don't have to buy something. Right. And um, I'm still told any minute we're going to have 70 um, Reno Influenza our battery, battery packs. packs. Yes. And we'll be swimming in Nissan Leaf modules. They'll be everywhere. To make batteries out of. I think my main investment's going to be paint. Yeah, probably. Yeah, and this at this point. Yeah, we're going to have to outsource that. The yeah. rest of it will be off the shelf stuff. Yeah. And we'll have a uh, electric. He was going to make this a two motor, uh, like a synchro. Oh, okay. <coughs> he had the parts to do it. I think I'll let him keep the front part of the transmission. And, uh, he gave me some, I've got disc kits for it. To yeah. Go to all disc brakes and some nice wheels. Um, yeah, the, the wheels look nice. I like it. Yeah. And so um, we'll have us a, a, a very rare VW Doka Doppel Cabine chicken truck. Yes. Yep. Powered by KFC. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I yeah, like maybe, it. maybe we'll repaint it red and white. <laughs> exactly. Chicken sauce. It's a chicken. At least a colonel's face. A colonel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what if we get away with that? A KFC <laughs> delivery truck. As we drive down the street, chicken feathers come flying out of the chicken where it flying used to be the exhaust. around the plane. <laughs> Could you ever be much finer? <laughs> Coming into Los Angeles, bringing in a couple of keys. Anyway, you gotta love it. You gotta love it. So, um, but uh, I'm amazed at how little this thing, we well, need a horn button to get through inspection and get it licensed. Yeah, I think we, I think we just need to get a, get a horn and, done. Uh, so it's in pretty good shape. Thank you, Oatmar. Yes, For thinking it. of us, this is going to be an interesting project, I think, and, uh, and really a pretty easy one. I, I don't expect a lot, unless this transmission is just a lot different from the other ones. And then why he kind of indicated not. Yeah, I can't, I can't imagine that it is. In fact, it may be the same bolt pattern. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we may be okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, we have uh, Siemens to VW. Um, yeah, we've got the adapters. Adapters. Yeah, we've got them. And um, so I'm, I'm, I'm seeing all off the shelf stuff. I don't have to write much in the way of checks here. We can just do this out of stock. And uh, except for the paint and glass. Yep, exactly. Yep. And um, we'll have us, I want it painted exactly the same electric yellow that we have the uh, thing, and they'll be like uh, a matched pair. Yeah, we can call this one Big Yellow. We'll call this the big thing. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And the other one the little thing. <laughs> the little thing. thing. <laughs> Why and not? it'll be a thing. It'll be a thing. And uh, yeah, I think they'll uh, they'll go very well together. Uh, they almost look like a matched uh, pair now. Uh, my favorite uh, color combinations, yellow and black. And uh, so we'll uh, get some new lenses, some new glass, 
um, I, I, I think it'll be an exciting build. I do too. I think it's um, pretty cool. Yeah. And we'll demonstrate again the Siemens motor demont controller and our new uh, find of uh, Nissan Leaf batteries. Batteries, yes. See if we can make that work in a vehicle. Yes. Cool. And um, since we're not in Arizona and we don't have <laughs> yeah, turtles, exactly. we'll I never think, know. I think it'll work out. Yeah, we'll good. never know. <laughs> uh, and but we're turning it into a VW shop. And but this is a uh, uh, interesting addition to the collection yes, because yeah. they're literally um, unheard of here in, the, in this country. Yeah, yeah, they're rare. And it's all because of. Colonel Harlan Sanders and his one-man assault <laughs> on the chicken farmers of Germany. Chicken. <laughs> and their kind of vicious response of a 25% chicken tax. And we responded in kind. No light commercial vehicles. None. And, um, and that's why you don't see them. By the way, that's exactly the same thing. It's, it's still in place today. And the Azure Dynamics van that we got right. is built in uh, Romania as a uh, passenger car with windows and a back and seat. seat. Sure, yep. And I thought they were sending these back. They're not. They send them to New York on a boat. And there's a company there that takes out the seats and the windows, puts in the metal panels so it's a commercial vehicle okay. again. Right. Now that they've gotten around the import tax. And they actually destroy the seats and windows. Really? I would like to get the seats and windows right. and put it back as a passenger yeah. van, but uh, the, it's I can't, just not get them, can't get them. Wow. They actually, and they don't ship them back to Romania or anything, but that's all about exactly the same chicken tax, which is still causing economic absurdities like that. Yeah, there's always a workaround. It's, it's a, yeah, absurd it's, yeah, what it's crazy. they're doing, but that's what they're doing to get around a 25% tax that didn't make a lick of sense the day it was signed. No, no, really and, didn't. And our government is working full-time at generating this sort of nonsense. They have millions of people working on it every day of the <laughs> year. Right. All day long. And it just <laughs> mystifies me how resilient the American spirit is to be able to survive year after year, decade after decade, and really thrive and prosper in the face right. of that much stupidity <laughs> pulled together into one town, fortunately located on our east coast, not out here in the hinterlands, <laughs> where to poison anybody. That's right, where they'd get us. <laughs> it's just a chicken tax indeed. Oh well. Yeah. We'll paint a chicken on it or something. There we go. Just like a little, like a like little, Van Dutch. Yeah, like Don a, Dutch did with his eyeball. Flying, yeah, a little, flying a eyeball. Doka tattoo. Yeah, we can do a little. A, of a German chicken. That's right. Yeah. Flying. Scared. <laughs> apparently, <laughs> apparently, apparently, it saved the German chicken industry. And there there uh, you go. They should be grateful to this day. But. Uh, as many Volkswagens as we sold, it seemed like they could just pay off the chicken farmers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> millions, <laughs> millions, of millions of beetles. Of beetles. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that's the Doka or Doppel Cabine. Cool. I like the vehicle. And yeah, uh, I, like I it. think it'll be a fun build and a simple one. And uh, I uh, kind of uh, thought. Richard Van Wyke was having too much fun with his blue one that he did for somebody. He did for a customer or something, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah he's yeah. doing conversions. Yeah, that was a nice, uh, nice build. The, 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 in spite of the constant announcements of the death of the whole conversion thing, there's people out there that do it for a living. Yeah. Um, and they do one after another. Yes, there are. I guess we do too, but we do it just to show you stuff. Yeah. And Because yep. uh, we can. At some point, we ought to start selling these. Because I really don't have any place to park this. I know one that's now. the thing we don't have any place uh, to put. Uh, oh, Martin's suggestion was we'll send it to the paint and body shop. They're always uh, late in getting that, it back that's to right. you. It'll take them forever. Good idea. I, I that's know. what we're going to do. Got storage. It, send it to some Hondurans to paint. <laughs> right. It'll and, take them forever. Maybe they'll lose it. Yeah. <laughs> It'll just take them forever. <laughs> Could be summer. That's right. And because uh, we literally Truck? don't have a place to park it. No. Um, and uh, so that's. Uh, 
the one complicating factor, but I'm glad I went ahead with the purchase. Um, I don't know what I pictured from the photographs, but more rust for one thing. Yeah, yeah, he, he took some fairly detailed pictures that looked fairly gory. Yeah, it, it, it didn't it, look good in the pictures. No, not not uh, really. But as in good. person, it's uh, yeah. I mean, this is nothing. We can't. Uh, we could grind most of this off ourselves and spray it here, but I want to send it out to get some parking space. Yeah. And um, we found some Hondurans. I don't think they're too expensive. All right. Um, we'll we'll give go them down a try and check them out. On this yeah. one. And uh, but I want the same electric yellow as the thing, and we'll call this the big thing, and that one the little thing. Yep. There you go. Okay. That one will be mine. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You can have the big thing. <laughs> there we go. The big thing. Stay with us. The Doppel K bean. Uh, yeah, I like it. it. And the chicken wars. Yes, and the chicken wars. That's it. That's this right. This is a perfect example of how good intentions and Democrats shouldn't be allowed in the same room. Really, Detroit has lobbied to keep that. See, that original tariff was also on right. potato starch and dextrin. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. And they dropped all that. But Detroit lobbied to keep that to protect their thing. Yeah. Well, then in the uh, 70s, we had a little gas crisis. Detroit was woefully out of position. Oh, man. And all the Asians come in selling small cars that were efficient and just killed them. Yeah. Had they not had this protection on the small commercial vehicles, they would have been responding to it. Yes, yeah. Too tricky by half. You won GM, Ford, Chrysler. Yes. And then you lost. And you're still losers. And now they're the new Fiat Chrysler company. In fact, Super Bowl ads going to have their new branding. Mm -hmm. They can issue press releases and announce things and rebrand <laughs> yeah. forever. <laughs> yep. You got to make cars that people want to buy. That people want to buy. And that's that's the deal. That's man. the difficult part. <laughs> and uh, but um, so I thought, what do you think? I, that I thought it. Omar uh, sent me some photos, and I thought, well, rust. Yeah. Increase. Yeah. Maybe we'll be lucky. But my view of Volkswagens, even like the Carmen Ghia looked good on eBay. Right. And then, oh my goodness, yeah. the a lot of work. Kind of rust we ground out of that thing. We could do another <laughs> Carmen Ghia. We had to give it a root canal. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so this one, and no, no doubt there's rust on it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Lens is broken, a couple of pox and the windshield and stuff. Yeah. You know. But not bad. But for a 90? Yeah. I think it's pretty straight. Yeah. No, when it wheeled up yesterday morning, it, it, it was I was surprised compared to the, the, the gory detail photos that Oatmar supplied. Yeah. And what a rare car. Yes. Um, I want to paint it this color. <laughs> Golf which ball is yellow. The color. <laughs> it's actually a Volkswagen color, by the way. Oh, that optic yellow? Wow. Yeah. And um, uh, that we did the thing. We got to get with him and get that paint code. You get the paint code, yeah. And do the doka in the same way, black and yellow, and we'll have a big thing and little thing. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> and I think that will be cool. Uh, but we, what we were talking about after shooting that is, uh, you know, it's such a. It looks kind of funny because it's a high bed and <laughs> short sides, but you don't realize there's uh, the wheels are underneath, so there's no. Wheel wells intruding no, in that space. No, it's completely There's no flat. wheel wells on the outside narrowing that space. Right. So you have a wide, flat space. If we could get that done by Epcon, we can mount a camera up there. That's our camera dolly sure. yeah, truck. That's what we need, yeah. And just wheel it around and shoot stuff from kind of an elevated uh -huh. position. And um, and it'll it'll be, um, uh, that's the perfect uh, a video platform. Yeah, nice, nice. Uh, and a lot camera of stuff truck. we do, particularly with rolling stuff, just looks better when you're kind of shooting down on uh -huh. it a little bit. Yep. And so um, I think that's uh, that's going to be a big play for us. Um, in 2010, it's hard to believe it's been that long. We concocted this um, scheme to lure advertisers into advertising on EVTV. We did. <laughs> they were all small companies, and they didn't really respond very well. Uh, 
But <laughs> if they would provide a product for this contest, we would run an ad for them for right. six months. And of course, the product would be featured in the build, which we would follow of the... This was the best ad advertising bargain anyone's ever had. It was a pretty good deal. <laughs> I think we... Uh, we didn't get much cash, but like they gave us two soliton ones mm -hmm. to use the soliton in that, and a couple of net gains uh, to use the net gain and so forth. Uh, none of them really renewed their ads. I still remember Seb saying that uh, you know we tripled our business that year, but then it leveled off. I think we've reached market penetration, market saturation. Saturation, yeah. He said, "Seb, there's no market yet. We're it's all <laughs> new blood, a rainmaker." <laughs> So still, and you just shut off the spigot. <laughs> so if you don't Oops. want to sell anymore, don't. <laughs> Oops. And I, I meant it as a joke. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, we uh, had uh, over a thousand submissions mm -hmm. that were supposed to be 25 words or less on why you wanted to win the contest mm -hmm. and what you would do with $20,000 worth of components. We actually bought... Um, 10,000 of it was uh, batteries. Was the batteries, yeah. yeah. 50 uh, Kalb SE uh, 180s. Mm -hmm. And uh, enough to do any vehicle. Yeah, that was a lot. Yep. And yep. Um, so Brandon Hollinger is a um, saxophone player from Scranton, Pennsylvania? Someplace in Pennsylvania. Yeah, yeah, some Lancaster, Scranton, someplace up Lancaster, there. Yes, maybe. Yeah. I can't remember exactly where. He had a, a lead-powered sob. Yes. Um, but nice body work. And, um, and he uh, applied for this and then did kind of a video campaign on YouTube. And mm -hmm. we didn't pick the winners. We picked the, each of us, each of the sponsors, and including EVTV, we each got to nominate two of the yeah. entries. Right, that's how we got to the 10, yes. And that gave us 10, and then for a four month period, um, you all voted on them. Mm -hmm. And um, and of course, uh, there was some ballot box stuffing uh, <laughs> uh, on a number of people's parts, but uh, uh, Brandon was better at it. He was pretty ones. good and at he, it. He mobilized the local community and did a uh, YouTube thing. This was all about a car that I kind of like. It's a uh, 74, 78? 74, yeah. Austin FX. Yes. Which is um, basically a London taxi. Yes. Um, and uh, I thought that was such a cool idea. Now, any of y'all want to make a few ducats on the side. These kids cannot stop themselves from getting married, even when it doesn't make any sense <laughs> any, any longer. They just get married and get married and get married and have babies left and right. And they love to rent cars. Uh, Fred Baining has a MGTD that people are calling him now. Oh, really? Wanting to rent the car for weddings. Oh, geez. And events. And that's cool. uh, essentially what Brandon's got going there. Along the way, somehow he got a, a burr under his saddle. I think he got to talking to Bob Batson or some one of the old heads who were pooping all his track record. He's a newcomer. He doesn't know what he's talking about. And so Brandon has set out to go through a checklist of everything we've ever said on a video about how to do an electric car and do it exactly the opposite. <laughs> the old 180 degree there rule. There is, is no <laughs> piece of this car done. He, I was apparently seeking to prove that he knows more than we do or that Bob does. Or, I, I don't know. But he, he's like had a checklist of every precept we've ever uttered at EVTV and has gone through and done exactly the opposite thing. <laughs> he's got battery management systems all over the car. Uh, I, you know, it's just, it's crazy. As a result, it's taken him three years to do this car. Oh, the Austin. Yeah, and he brought it, he brought it to the show last August. Yes, yeah. he did. Yes. And, uh, and, um, and by the way, it's a beautiful car. Yes. And he does some beautiful um, video work. Very creative yes. guy. Yeah. Um, but I don't know where he just got it in his head. That, uh, and every time I see him, he's, he's bent on proving whatever I said <laughs> two minutes ago to be wrong. <laughs> 
Brandon. It's, uh, we love you. You don't know how little's in that Easter basket for you there, buddy. <laughs> if you want to cash in on me being wrong, you're way at the end of the line. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot there's, of that there's a lot there's a whole line that's right <laughs> you ain't done no thing but anyway uh, take a look at his uh, um, Austin FX1 when my love stands next to your love I can't compare love when it's not love Hello boys and girls, here's a hearty welcome back to the periodic video updates of the EVTV Build Your Dream EV Contest. 2013 has been one heck of a year both musically and electrically. Let me try to bring you up to date with our progress on the London Cab electric vehicle conversion. This build incorporates the net gain Warp 11 DC motor. Because we now have access to awesome lithium battery technology, we're asking more of our motors and controllers, and for longer periods. More folks are using forced air to keep their motors cool when under heavier use. Instead of running a noisy blower all the time though, I decided to make use of the motor's built-in thermocoupler. But unfortunately, no one really knows how to use it. So with some helpful advice from the guys at EV West, I set out to change that internal sensor, all period by period myself period. As if changing from automatic to manual transmission and adding air conditioning where there wasn't any previously wasn't enough work, I decided to rip out the vehicle's wiring harness and the brake lines and completely replace them. I soon discovered that several wheel cylinders also needed replacing, as did both rear bearings. Last year I did learn with the Saab that a bad wheel bearing can cost me around 10% of my range. So this decision was pretty easy. Except for the actual instrument cluster, the taxi had no place to mount anything on the dashboard. There was only a flimsy vinyl cover thing to hide wires and ductwork. So I made a cardboard mock-up that included a console for mounting a maintenance switch stereo and an Android tablet. The purpose of the tablet is to run a VMS, GPS, and uh, perhaps a backup camera. These JLD612 units are intended to run battery warmers, one per box. The panel that we made out of a 1985 Chevy tailgate. We decided to uh,
back in June, I had decided that the taxi would be drivable and have fully functional air conditioning for the convention in August. Well, mission accomplished. My dad and I trailered it down to the third annual EVCON electric vehicle conversion convention in southern Missouri, home of Jack Rickard's EVTV and the Build Your Dream EV contest. This is where the major components were won back in 2011. When my love stands next to your love, I can't compare love. That's a nice looking vehicle. It is. Think, and he, you, you know, know, I mean, he does I go really to extremes like it. to uh, yes. clean out the, the engine compartment down to bare metal yes. and that sort of I like that part. Yeah. We get calls every day. And the heart of the car call is, I love your show. I want to do a build. If I did, do you think it would work? Oh, yeah. yeah we get a lot of that. Oh, the answer is yeah. Yeah. It, it, I, just, just my do perspective, it. an eight-year-old girl can do an electric car conversion. There's no magic to that. It is a serial exercise in small problem solving, and you have to have a certain amount of patience and persistence. Yes. But um, no part of it is really require any friends from the great NASA layoff no, no, to no, participate. No. And, and it's gotten simpler. And it, it is getting simpler. Yes. Um, and, um, you know, it's kind of what level do you want to take it to? You can get into some corners. Sure. Mostly on stuff that doesn't have anything to do with driving an electric car. Well, it does, but he air conditioning. Sure. Yeah, that's where it usually LTA is. experiments. Um, yeah. Yeah. Windmills, solar panels, yeah, um, yeah, every gauge integrated things like that. Yeah, yeah. Gets, the the creatives get you in trouble. Yes, you want a motor in it with a battery driving it to roll down the road. It works pretty good yeah. since the advent of the lithium battery. Yes, That's yeah, where we're at. So uh, yeah, you can do it, um, and many have done it who are not particularly well equipped uh, to start doing it when they start. And I would hold myself as a premier example of that. <laughs> I didn't change Both the oil us. in my own cars <laughs> when we started this. My entire interest was the batteries, not the cars. Right, we bought the batteries first to play with them. I and I still, if I drop a bolt, we have to buy a new one because I can't <laughs> reach the floor to pick it up. <laughs> Anything that I do actually thread into a hole I have equipped Mr. Noto with a, a broad, deep, and expensive lineup of tap and dies, <laughs> and then equipping him and enabling him to recover from any bolt that I might have threaded into all. That's somewhere. right, just a cross Give thread. Him some patience and just the right angle. That's on right, it. that's right. Sometimes you have to work in he that. He can tap. usually tap it out, <laughs> and, uh, and we can still use it. That's right. And so, uh, a reusable hole, imagine Beyond that, that <laughs> um, it's, uh, <coughs> it's kind of cool. Um, so that's um, Brandon in the Austin FX. Mm -hmm. You can certainly do a build. And uh, I would report, not from my own uh, perspective, but that I have heard from our viewers over and over and over again that on completion, when they're driving this vehicle with no gas, that's very perky and alert mm -hmm. yes. and feels good. Yep that the sense of personal satisfaction is just overwhelming. And I would say a significant number of them, if not the majority, um, wind up as serial car converters. Yes, we've, we've had some of our viewers Stop do a number of Stop me before I convert That's again. That's right, right, including us. <laughs> and uh, now some of the old hands will recognize this. You get to where you're driving down the road, I don't care how many you've done, or how cool your car is. Every car that goes by, you're measuring it for batteries. <laughs> right. How many can I put in I that one? Wonder, wonder what that would be like. <laughs> that's right. And it'd be, that'd be a tough build. That's right. That's a tough I build. bet we could do it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, that's just how you start looking at cars. It is. It is. And every car you see, like, how many batteries can I get in there? That's right. What's the trunk look like? Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, and so, so there you go. Um, my uh, one of our interns mm -hmm. um, 
and uh, being an intern around here is not as much fun as I make it look like. Um, <laughs> it's usually a hard day. I'm not quite the same guy to work for here as you see on camera. And the one man that knows that better than me is Matt Hauber. That's right. That's right. Matt. No illusions. <laughs> uh, he's uh, living the dream. He's out he in is. San Diego. They're doing some great stuff, doing some great builds. He and uh, Michael helped with an 818 build that I understand came out very nicely. Oh, really? Cool. Uh, they're doing something with a little all-terrain vehicle that has a motor on each wheel. And can turn on its own radius. Oh, really? It's a zero turn ATV. Really? With how electric motors on each wheel. Uh, how cool. It lost funding, and somehow they're going to help them they're play with gonna it. They're going to play with it, huh? And, okay. Uh, keep developing. Uh, this week, Young Harbor tries to blow up a watermelon. and He went Gallagher on us? He went Gallagher. <laughs> you got to see this. All right, I'm Michael Bream. And I'm Matt Harbor. We're from EV West and it's Friday, so we're gonna have a little bit of fun today. What we're gonna do, first of all, is we're gonna show you what some high voltage uh, systems do to some standard car fuses. Uh, there's a lot of um, kind of unknowns as far as you know how powerful the high voltage systems are in electric vehicles. So we're just gonna do a little demonstration for you today. Yeah, yeah. We're gonna set up a, uh, a high voltage contactor over here. We're gonna run approximately 250 volts DC through your standard 12 volt fuse holder. Uh, we see a lot of this in electric car installations. People mm -hmm. are using these, you know, fuse holders made for 12 volts. Right. I don't think they realize how dangerous it really is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to short circuit. It's got a regular 25 amp fuse in this, and in a 12 volt system, it would just pop and you'd replace it and it would be fine. Right. Um, with 250 volts DC, it's a little different. <laughs> so we're going to go ahead and show you what that does. And uh, after that, we're going to have a little bit of fun. We brought out. Uh, what? Watermelons, hot dogs, various household apple. items to kind of show you what uh, some of the voltage stuff can do. So yeah. we're going to start. We're going to go ahead and um, put 250 volts to this fuse. We're going to short circuit it and yeah. we're just going to kind of work our way from there and have fun on a Friday. Yeah. All right, let's start the show. That's good. Three, two. All right, so. As you can see, it was a small plasma ball. Uh, the contactors in here are completely melted. The fuse holder is worthless, and uh, the wire even melted the insulation a little bit here. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and pop off another 12 volt fuse, then we're gonna start going up to some other items. Let's check it out. Three, two. Well, our big fuse, fared no better, obviously. Kind of reminds me of those old movies with the old flash bulbs where it was like uh, gunpowder or something. It just blows up. Uh, but yeah, this is toast. Uh, we're gonna keep on going up. I think we're gonna, I think we're gonna try a hot dog next, simulate some human flesh. This might be scary. We've never done this before, so we have no idea what's gonna happen. Uh, let's, see what, let's see what happens. And three, two, all right, well, that was a little disappointing. We thought that the hot dog would simulate human flesh and we kind of thought we'd have a little small explosion, uh, but nothing. It must be a high impedance hot dog, I don't know. Uh, we're gonna play around with some uh, household items. We're gonna light a bulb, see what happens with 250 volts. And three, two. All right, well, the standard incandescent bulb was a little boring. I think it's because the filament's so small, it just uh, broke and we lost conductivity. So. Uh, we're going to try a gas-filled bulb. We're going to use your uh, common CFL, compact fluorescent light. Let's see what happens with that. In three, two. Oh, well. Now this is odd. We uh, expected a small explosion. We didn't expect this. Uh, the bulb lit up. So I guess we can run compact fluorescent bulbs off of 250 DC. I don't know, maybe in the back of your conversion you want some nice fluorescent mood lighting, something like that. Uh, go ahead and use a CFL move on to the next item. Well, the hot dog didn't do much, so we're gonna go back and play with uh, some fruits now. We're gonna try your common orange, see what happens. In three, two. Well, you know, we, we, like I said, we haven't tried any of this before. We were a little surprised. We thought we were gonna make some orange juice, but uh, I think we just have a, a slightly above room temperature orange. Let's try something else. 
All right, well, at this point of the video, we, we honestly thought we'd have food everywhere. Um, and the food's been a little boring. It, it seems like the metallic stuff's worked real well, the fuses, we got some nice little explosions. Um, so this is uh, our Gallagher moment. We're gonna try and blow up a watermelon. I thought that it would be a bigger explosion. We're gonna plug this thing in, see if we can get it to do anything at all. Let's check it out. In three, two. All right, well, the uh, orange was a dud, the hot dog was a dud, the watermelon a dud. Seems like the only thing that was exciting was the metallic stuff, so we're gonna play with tinfoil. Player in three, two. All right, there you have it. You know, some things were a little more exciting than we thought, and some things were actually kind of boring. Uh, what we really wanted to point out is, you know, how dangerous these 12 volt connectors are. Even if you have a low amperage fuse, if you're hooking them up to a high voltage circuit, it's extremely dangerous. Uh, until next time, we'll find some more stuff to uh, electrify. I'm Michael Bream with EV West, and we'll see you soon. In order to <laughs> secure Young Harbor's safety, I may have implied that high voltage DC is somewhat dangerous. <laughs> and it is. Uh, mostly from sparks and burns. Yes, yes. As a voltage, Edison had it quite correct. You see, AC voltage uses your skin as kind of a linear capacitor and goes right into you. Yes. But DC voltage, the skin actually, unless it's very uh, wet with perspiration and salt, is uh, actually kind of an insulator. And so you'll find that up to about 300 volts DC, you can kind of... Kind of touch both ends. Touch both ends. And, <laughs> and as I, I, you know, I traced Joseph, I told him, he asked me what would happen if he touched both ends, and I told him I thought he would explode. <laughs> That's from right. Least, uh, That's right. That was to keep him from trying Keep him from trying it. That's right. Poor Trace. <laughs> but in fact, uh, Edison was quite correct. AC is a killer, and DC is relatively benign. Uh, that said, and, and ergo, the disappointment with the hot dog. Yeah, the hot pork. And the water. <laughs> However, they got some pretty good action out of that fuse. They did that. They? that I like that. Uh, and that their message foil. is quite correct. That, that's a 12-volt fuse. Here is a fuse. This is, uh, I'm going to call this a Ferris Shawmut A50QS1000-4. We carry these in our store. That's because we're EVTV and we can. You'll never need a fuse that big. Um, John Metric might need a fuse that big, but right, right. you'll never need a fuse that big. We have smaller fuses. However, this is a can of sand. And uh, when it blows, it um, kind of blows. The, the interesting issue is uh, that at 500 volts DC, Many things that would uh, melt, like your 12-volt fuse, are not sufficiently separated to break the arc of the current flow through them. Oh, yeah. And so yeah. the current continues to flow, and that's, uh, uh, of course, it, it, they didn't have a slow enough motion camera there to quite see it, but right. it, after the fuse blew, uh, the reason it blew up the holder was it was still flowing current. Still flowing current, yeah. So you have to have fuses designed for high voltage to break high voltage uh, on a more practical sense. And I have not listed these in the store because they're impossibly small and I can't see them and we're behind <laughs> and busy. That's right. But I actually busy. have a quantity of these. This is a Ferris Shawmut, part number 30321AB, 600 volt, 30 amp, um, torque to 20 inch pounds. It is a fuse holder. And there are a variety of fuses you can put in there. Uh, we normally look for an ATM fuse. Mm -hmm. And the ATM fuse, and we'll have a selection of these in the store if I ever do get this. Yeah, up, we've got them here. Where you can order this <laughs> and then specify the fuse you want <laughs> That's in. That's right. Uh, this is an ATM 20, Ferris Shawmut. Now, Ferris Shawmut doesn't actually exist. This says Ferris Shawmut because they didn't change the drawing. This does too. They're actually now uh, owned by a company called um, Mer Merson, French company, 
and this one is actually a Merson HP-10M. It's 10 amps good for 1,000 volts. Mm -hmm. The ATMs are good for 600 volts, and this is a 20 um, ATM 20 here, and that will break 600 volts and 20 amps. Now, what would I use that for? My heating system on the sure. uh, uh, Escalade uh, draws 15 amps. Right. Um, your DC to DC converter, on the other hand, um, this is a 10 amp fuse that typically draws two or three amps. Right. Right. And so, in this way, you can protect your circuitry and prevent a fire uh, by having a safety fuse in line with the thing. And we don't talk really enough about that because it's boring. Right. But now you know, <laughs> we actually do, I've got a box of a hundred of Yeah, these, we've got a uh, bunch of the fuse um, holders. Fuse holders. It's got yeah. a hole in it, so you, you run a... Just run a screw down through it. And what, what do the Mexicans call the self hand? Oh, a uh, auto perforante. Auto perforante? Yes. Take an auto perforante and stick it down in there, <laughs> into your car somewhere, yep. and this is on there pretty good. And you pop that fuse, and there's a screw hole, a screw on each end. I like to put the little fork tabs and um, and hook that up and you have a fuse link. Uh, I don't know what they cost, but nothing. Yeah, they're not, um, not that much. These cost quite a bit. These are expensive, yeah. Um, and that's what you want your high voltage link to your controller, but fusing is somewhat important. And that was the point Young Harbor was trying to make and he made it very well. Yes. And it's good to see you, Matt and um, Michael. Yep. And, uh, they still want to have fun in they, San Diego. They, they do. They're having fun out there <laughs> with high voltage. Uh, Not even high voltage. I, I was really pulling for them on the water. Oh, I wanted the watermelon to blow. I wanted to go Gallagher. They, they did put, you know, electrodes they did, in they there. They Frankenstein that wet, watermelon. <laughs> I knew that wasn't going to work. Yeah. <laughs> aluminum foil was cool. The, the aluminum foil was pretty good. <laughs> so that's, um, that's pretty much our show. I have about, uh, I don't know, five or six orders. Guys have snuck in and put them up. A couple people I want to send them to. I've got 30 of these. This is the Jev Q. Mm -hmm. uh, I could have shipped them a week ago, 10 days ago. The software is kind of dicked up. My ass clowns, of course, are all, <laughs> they got their nose out of joint at me. But worse, most of them don't even have a test bench and none of them have a car. And yeah, so it's difficult. That, there's a yeah. lot of stuff in the software that needs uh, some work. I can program in C++. Actually, I'm quite good at it, but uh, it takes time to get your head in it. Yeah. And so I've been playing with it this week. A couple of um, the less exciting things, like the pre-charge uh, concept oh, yeah, was badly so. broken. Yeah. It didn't work at all. Um, the DMOC 645 has to have a CAN bus message from this right away. Oh. Or it uh, times out, faults out, and lays down and quits. It doesn't do anything. Oh, man. And it won't spin the motor. And so okay. you can't do a pre-charge like before you power everything up as part of the setup. You have to come up and be squirting CAN bus messages. And at the same time, I want one of these pins to engage our pre-charge relay and apply voltage to the high voltage capacitors in the DMOC. Okay. And after... Uh, and he, they had an RC time constant where you entered the resistance and the capacitance, and it was bizarre. Uh, it was interesting, except only to us. Yeah, right. You, yeah. you just put Who in cares? a time value. Yeah. Uh, and so I made it where you enter it in milliseconds, 500 milliseconds, or 1,000 milliseconds would be a second. And it's mm -hmm. the time delay that you'll turn on your pre-charge and then turn on your main contact. Okay. And then once the main contact is on, you turn off the, uh, 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 and, and none of this has to be done manually. You can put in what output pins you want to run those, and they're active lows. So you put 12 volts to your contactor and 12 volts to your pre-charge relay and hook the grounds up to these pins, and this box will um, run those relays just fine. And now it'll do it uh, in the time uh, you want from when you start up. Um, it'll set the pre-charge relay on, and whatever value you enter, it'll that many milliseconds later uh, close the main and open the thing. There you go. Uh, I also uh, cooling is an issue, um, and uh, but only on the freeway for the thing. 
Yes. That's and right, yeah. uh, it's not a big issue at all in January. Um, and fortunately, our uh, DMOC 645 actually reports a lot of temperatures uh, yeah, over the CAN yeah, bus, yeah. including the stator temperature, the rotor temperature, the inverter temperature, and the system temperature, which is some combination defined in DMOC software okay. that I'm not sure. Okay. We have picked the inverter temperature because that's the one that tends to be the most sensitive, right. the IGBTs. We always run our coolant through the uh, uh, controller first, or inverter, then through the motor. This is in a series system. Sometimes we'll parallel them and have two different loops. And it works a fine, lasts a long time. And the thing, we have two um, De Raleigh heat exchangers with um, fans that are howlers. Yeah, they're... they're I don't need loud. them in January. I don't need them in town at all, and they're loud. Now, on the freeway where I need them, I can't hear them anyway. Right. Yeah, you're not going to hear them with road noise. So what I want is to be able to put a uh, one of our eight outputs, again, to switch a relay with a, with a ground uh, to turn on the fans. Sure. Yep. Now, the pump's going all the time, but to turn on the fans to increase the efficiency. Yeah, of the yeah heat, right. Heat really, really start to cool. And, yeah. um, and do that. Um, the... Uh, and I want to put a temperature where you turn it on and a different temperature where you turn it off. Sure. So when it gets to 120 degrees Fahrenheit, it comes on. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it stays on until it drops to 90. Yeah, right. Some range. And, and yeah. So that eliminates the hysteresis. Yes. Uh, and it, So it'll cycle on and off, but it won't be jumping. Right. You know. And so it lets you put in two temperatures and designate a pin. Um, this is our package. Um, we were unable to get, in that quantity anyway, uh, the uh, box that uh, Paula was using. Oh, yeah. The and, and instead, we got technique. a powder coated box, and powder coat doesn't take laser etching very well. It, no, we found that out. <laughs> and so we had some little plates made that actually have the uh, pin numbers uh, and so forth um, for the Amp Seal 35, and that's a big deal here. I mean, this, this is basically an Arduino Dewey, but it's in a box, and, and it has a real connector for a car. And so you're not dealing with the little wires and the yeah. breadboard oh, and, and things shaking loose. Uh, it's all, uh, this connector is on the circuit board itself. There's no yeah, wires right. in, inside. So it just makes it more stable and so forth. But how many times you come across the thing, you know you know what the pins are. We got the pin out on the box. Little antenna for our wireless. Here is something I'm kind of proud of. We're going to give you a um, wire harness. And this is the Amp Seal 35. It goes to the Jiv Q. Uh, I really only do about 24 inches. Uh, and there's really only a couple of wires that go from the JevQ to the DMOC. Right, you can put the JevQ anywhere. And yeah. so this is the 23 pin that goes on the DMOC. You got two wires. Mm -hmm. Red would be 12 <laughs> I'd, I'd volts. Say 12 volts. Black would be ground. <laughs> so it's powered up. And I went ahead and wired a little RS-232. Why do you think that yeah. is? They might have to plug in their uh, computer. You know, they might have to. Uh, it's yeah. conceivable that you might have to reflash that firmware or mm -hmm. make a change to it. Yeah. There's a program out there called CC Shell. That's an advanced topic. I don't expect anybody to do that. We flash the DMOX mm -hmm. um, on all of ours uh, to exactly what's in the VW thing. There's a bunch of people with DMOX out there that didn't get them from us. Uh, oh, I know. I don't know what you're going to do, guys. Um, <laughs> Oops. You're welcome to prowl around the forums and see what we did, and there's some files there and so forth, but um, it's not something I can support. Um, this is a bunch of multicolor wires, and they actually have labels on them. And um, th they're mostly your gazinas and gazatas. Four analog inputs, mm -hmm. four digital inputs, eight uh, uh analog or digital outputs, and um, and then grounds and 5 volts and 12 volts uh, to power sensors and things. And so this is like a, a six-foot cable about six, yeah. braided. And, um, and so I thought it would be nice to have a nice uh, professional 
and that's done by a company out in California for us. A um, little miscommunication, a uh, little employee that's not with us anymore. Um, but the original spec was for them to have each wire individually colored. And um, they've, uh, this, some people made a command level decision it would be faster and cheaper um, to, to just Oops. have colored wires and not do it Jack's way and put labels on them. But in revisiting, I found out that the labels are actually more expensive than having the signal names imprinted on the wires every two inches. Really? Mm -hmm. So the second wow. uh, set of things will actually have D out one and D out two printed every two inches along the length of the wire. Wow. And nice. so you don't need the uh, labels. Um, but anyway, a nice uh, thing. We'll put a book in there with it and a catalog. Um, and, and we're going to have software in here that actually works. That'd be good. And you can configure it and you can run a DMOC 645 from it. The open source software and how you update that and so forth, um, it, it, I think Colin's got three versions. I've got two. Um, mm. It's kind of breaking into sort of a mess. We've got three or four different versions of the hardware. Some of the original key coders don't even have the latest hardware um, <laughs> and probably aren't going to have it. Probably they, not going to. Unless they build it. Um, the, um, and so chaos reigns supreme. Cool. But it's, uh, I'm, I, I've been working on this for a year. I'm really quite taken with the way it came out and the software that's in it up to a point. Uh, it does time slice very nicely, hmm. um, which uh, if you will ever know. It's fairly uh, object-oriented, so okay. doing it for other controllers, sure, yeah. a no thing. Doing it for uh, your, your uh, BMS, putting the whole thing in there, is no big thing. Interfacing it to OBD2, again, you have two CAN buses here. Oh, sure. Um, you can put data out the OBD2 and, uh, and capture it in an Android with Torque or something mm -hmm. All right. um, to do displays. Um, the whole hand thing was a little lost on me at first, and I think a, a, a significant element of our viewership. It's taken over the commercial automobiles completely, but they've been a step at a time. Bosch um, developed this in uh, 1982. 1987, uh, a computer, uh, a controller area network specifically for cars. It has uh -huh. two lines. Yeah. They're not receive and transmit. They're high and low. They're just two differential right. lines. Right. And you twist them together and they're, they're really quite noise resistant. And, yeah. and it's like, you know, plus 12 volts and minus 12 volts or something. They're like a differential. Um, hmm. How far have they taken this? Uh, now we've got four analog inputs, four digital inputs, eight digital outputs. Is that enough to run a car? Why don't we put more? The Arduino has 50. Uh, I don't want to deal with 50. Bosch didn't want to deal with 50. The increasing electronics in the cars was getting, we're looking at this cable. Yeah, right. It's right. Uh, three quarters of an inch in diameter and it's heavy. And uh, you can imagine as you wire up the car, it just gets to be more and more copper. Yeah, it's just copper flowing through the car. So you don't do that. You want more analog inputs, take a Dewey, hook it up to analog inputs, and put can on it. And have it report to go. this one. Yeah. And by the way, mount it close to what it's measuring. If it's batteries, put them on the batteries. Sure. Um, and that's the way it's done. How far can this be taken? On your driver's side door of your car, there are four switches for windows and would you believe you only have one in the driver's side door? What are the okay. other three for? I don't know. For the other three windows. Yeah. From the driver's From the position, driver's you, position, can position you can do them all. Again. Right. Yeah. Now there's a switch on each of those other ones. And if you to use that switch, it'll make it go up and down. To individually well. do, yeah. How do they have that wired, right? Must be by can. All four of them are multi controllers. Yeah. Yeah. On a CAN bus, yeah. there's only two wires linking that just snake all around and together. link all of them together. Yeah. And um, and so the software, the the one on the the rear passenger uh, door, 
if if you're pushing the switch, it overrides whatever the driver's sending. Okay. Um, yeah. You can can uh, he's rolling Control it down, it you can roll it back roll up. up. That's right. Um, the uh, but if, you, if there's no way sitting there, the, the the driver's got control. It's all worked out. But those are individual controllers on a two wire bus. Okay. That are communicating yeah. with uh, data addresses and and data, and um, it's um, there's no uh, talk about a protocol. Well, there's barely a protocol there. Okay. Yeah. You have a Just 29 addresses. bit address slash identifier. What they're saying is, this is the identifies the from. message. Yeah. That's both where it's coming from and what it is. Mm -hmm. You're supposed to know if you're listening for that message that this number message means air conditioner compressor pressure. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Yep. And there's eight a byte payload that it carries that can be anything. It's made up. So sure. uh, one way to, to do the pressure is to uh, uh, multiply it by 10 to get rid of the decimal point and carry it in two bytes. Okay, that makes sense. And yeah, so the other easy. end just has to know, well, I uh, have to put those back put together that, and divide it by 10 and I get the, the, the fully um, the decimal um, a floating point number, but but a floating point number is six or eight bytes, but we did it in two. Yeah, that's a lot better. All you yeah, have to do is know two. that. Yeah. How, how did he pack the data? And you can have all eight eight bytes, every bit be a different bit of information. It's defined in the software in the two ends. The protocol knows nothing. There's no protocol. It's just the data. It knows the, the length address. of the package because right. that's in the identifier and the identifier. And everybody's just throwing messages up, and they all have filters. Yeah, it only there's, there's yeah. 100 devices throwing up messages. This device only cares about messages from two guys. Yeah. And it only gets two different kinds of messages from each of those two guys. That's four messages. It sets up a mask and a filter. It doesn't even see the other traffic. It doesn't get through the transceiver because it doesn't care about it. It doesn't know what to do with it. All right. Yeah. Um, right. and, uh, and so the whole car, uh, you pointed out this ISIS or Osiris. Yeah, I, yeah or, I, ISIS, uh, the wiring system. Yeah, it's yeah. a wiring system. That's what it is, is replace all the wires with a two-wire bus and do it intelligently. Yeah. And that's what Bosch came up with. Cool. This device has two cans in it. You can actually bridge data from one CAN bus to another okay. at different speeds. Okay. But you have to write the software to do that. We've uh, written software that basically takes an accelerator position, commands the DMOC 645, it'll uh, turn your cooling on, mm -hmm. and it'll do your precharge. Yep. And you can do whatever else. And But, you know, it, it opens the door to a huge mm -hmm. right. number of things. I think uh, Mike was wanting to run four controllers. We'll put two on each CAN bus. You put all four of them on one, just give them each a different address. Different address, uh, yeah. Either way, it's very flexible. So I've got to be a big CAN fan. I think that's the future to adding functionality, displays, so forth to the vehicle. And, um, and JevQ is our first effort at that. It is open source hardware. I think what uh, I've been through making it, good luck on making it. <laughs> making the hardware, stuff. yeah. Uh, drawings. Um, it is open source software. Uh, again, you, you get what you pay for. Right. Uh, <laughs> up to a point, but but it's a good start, and it's and it's open. Yeah, it's open. Anybody can take it and do anything you want to it. You can take this box, write write a little software, you use the software that's in it, and make it a proprietary product. We don't care. Um, but the idea is that the operation of the cars is too proprietary. We're going to use this as a reverse engineering tool yeah. to open the open Pandora's box right. of Nissan inverters and Nissan battery management systems and Tesla inverters and Tesla charging systems. We can use this same thing to just sniff the traffic and log it off to a farm. Right, right. And then I can pour through it all, all night, every night, <laughs> for months, forever, trying to figure out what the different message formats are, reverse yeah. engineer that. And so 
we've attempted to make kind of a professional hardware package for this, and the software is available. And, um, and the interesting thing is that USB port uh, right there, if you hook that up to your laptop and uh, take the Arduino IDE, the Arduino IDE can't tell this is not an Arduino Dewey. Okay. okay. So, anything so yeah, anything you write can be uploaded to this. To that, yeah. And in the main, you want to actually connect the dots to what the Arduino pins are to our Amphenol 35 pin uh, to where you can make it dance. Okay. And cool. so, uh, for the, the software credible among you, this is uh, going to be uh, a party box. Yeah, you can do whatever you want. For the rest of you, you'll be able to take a DMOC 645 and a Siemens and make it spin. Yeah, that's right. And that's make a car out of it. You know, been the uh, immediate issue. I have a hundred Siemens motors. How many DMOCs do we have down there? Thirty something. Yeah, 30s. low thirties. Yeah. So yeah. that's going to eventually get to be a problem. I'm talking to Damian McGuire, trying to get him to do me some sort of an inverter. If I send enough semiconductor stuff to him, there you go. Maybe you will. <laughs> Uh, guys, this is probably going on too long now. Somebody cut me stop, off. Stop, stop get, me get, before get the hook. I keep talking. Get, get the hook and pull him off I the am. set. <laughs> we'll see you next week. Hey, stay with us. And remember, VW That's right. stands for Volkswagen, the people's car. See you then. <laughs>